all right? All right. Uh, this is Bading. I'm Lido. I go by Lido Nico underscore on Twitter. I work for Destroy All Software. Uh, help run a conference called Deconstruct. Which if you liked Bang Bang Con, you might also like that one. So I hope to see you all in Seattle. This is the story of what happens when you turn on a Game Boy. Uh, it involves a clever and litigious company, trademark law, a microscope, nitric acid, and one very dedicated materials science student. So this is a Game Boy. Have you all seen one of these before? They're a good time, right? Like you can play Pokemon Red on them, and also Pokemon Blue, and also probably some other games. Uh, <laughs> and when you turn a Game Boy on, this happens. I think we have audio. We might. The Nintendo logo scrolls down the screen. And when it hits the middle, uh, it goes ba-ding. That's what this talk is about. So what is going on here? Like, how does this process work? All of that happens in the boot ROM. The drawing the Nintendo logo on the screen, the scroll, all of that happens in the boot ROM, which is read-only memory that lives inside the Game Boy's CPU. CPU does other things like calculations, and that's what your game programs to run. Uh, so that thing up in the middle, the large chip that says CPU on, it's the CPU. Um, inside that, there is some read-only memory that is running when you turn on the game. The weird thing is, the boot ROM has a copy of the Nintendo logo and doesn't use it. <laughs> Instead, it reads from the game. It issues a read to the game to get a copy of the Nintendo logo that it then draws on screen and scrolls down. Uh, so why is it like that? Well, turns out this Nintendo logo is a registered trademark. You can tell because it has a little R in the circle at the corner. Uh, and once the Nintendo logo hits the middle of the screen, the boot ROM compares, did you draw the correct Nintendo logo on the screen? So if you did not, the Game Boy, it doesn't even like stop or halt using the correct instruction. It'll just loop forever. But if you did draw the correct logo, your Game Boy will go on to play Pokemon Red. Um, after it's compared every pixel in that logo correctly. The reason they do this is so you have a copy of the Nintendo logo in your game, so if they didn't like your game, they could sue you for trademark infringement, <laughs> which is a really, really clever form of copy protection. They didn't need to give you a secret key or something. They just say, put the Nintendo logo in the game, and if we hate this, we won't let you release the game. So that's clever and kind of icky in a way, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, it, that's the kind of solution you come up with if you have a legal department, right? <laughs> like, it's not... <laughs> but uh, that's neat, but that's not the thing I'd actually like to tell you about. The actual thing I'd like to tell you about is how did someone figure out what the boot ROM was? Like, games are meant to be read from. You can take your game out of the Game Boy and put it in a thing that has the correct pins and issues like some reads, and it will tell you like, all right, that's a one, that's a zero, and you can get a whole Game Boy's ROM. But the boot ROM exists inside the CPU, and the CPU's inputs and outputs are not the boot ROM's inputs and outputs. So what's going on there? Uh, in general, not too many people cared. By 2005, this was a minor mystery. If you're writing an emulator, you're fine with the whole situation because you write your boot ROM to jump straight into the game. You don't need to scroll the Nintendo logo, and besides, it makes it less likely for you to get sued. <laughs> the Game Boy by 2005 had become the Game Boy Color, and then the uh, Game Boy Advance, and then the Game Boy Advance SP, and then the Nintendo DS, and no one was paying attention until someone who goes online by the name Nivixti. Uh, Nivixti was a material science student at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and got access in his uh, material science lab to a scanning electron microscope. He immediately thought, I know what I want to do with this. I want to look at video games. <laughs> it was a great thought process. He at first was starting with Super Nintendo chips, and he needed to get the resin off the CPU because the silicon is encased in resin, and was going at it with a file, which he quickly learned just destroys the whole thing, not just the resin. So he asked a friend in the chemistry department, like, could I get some acid, some strong acid? In fact, he asked, could I get some hydrofluoric acid to dissolve the chip in? <laughs> now, hydrofluoric acid is a thing that is so corrosive that if you get it on your skin, it will dissolve your bones. Um, so his friend told him, no, sorry, absolutely not. In fact, 
the friend probably used stronger language than that because chemists know to respect fluorinated compounds. But <laughs> his chemist friend did give him nitric acid. Nitric acid is not great either. Uh, it, if you get it on your lab gloves as you're working, your gloves will catch on fire. Um, so people in general work without gloves. And uh, Nivixi just took a sample vial of nitric acid out onto the university lawn uh, on a sunny day in May, uh, put it in a pot of boiling water, I guess just on a burner, and dropped a Game Boy chip, a Game Boy CPU that someone had sent him. And the nitric acid reacts with the resin and it like, makes a horrible smoke. It probably smelled awful. But he got a beautiful chip decapsulation out of that. This is the actual picture he took. It is still up online. Um, this is a Game Boy CPU. Uh, Nivixi helpfully labeled it with many question marks. Uh, <laughs> the green things are uh, logic units, processors. The red is SRAM. The yellow are question marks. And the blue, the blue is what we're interested in looking at, which is the Game Boy's boot ROM itself. This is masked ROM. Masked ROM is you start out with a grid of dots of solder, all which re represent ones, and you burn off the places you want to be zeros for the bits. Uh, you can make this very quickly because you can make a mask of like, what you want to keep. Uh, so it was used in early electronics often. It looks like this, and you can count out the bits by eye if you happen to have a scanning electron microscope. <laughs> So you can see you read it bottom to top, left to right. So you can see the first bit at the very bottom is an empty space, so that's a zero. And then above that, it's a one. Uh, and it you know, keeps going. I find this really hard to see. Like This one does not look like a one. It's a like, shadow on the dot of solder that prevents you from seeing it. So Nivixti did that by eye, carefully error checking, like carefully going through bead of solder by bead of solder to read out all of the data on this chip. First of all, that's not a Z80 instruction, Game Boy Z80 CPU. Um, or it's not a sensical one. It's like a load from a register that doesn't, it isn't initialized yet to another register that isn't initialized yet. So something's going on here. I was trying to figure out what the code was running. I was, in fact, trying to read this whole thing by eye. And you get out a bunch of garbage. So it probably means that data is interleaved in some way. I spent a solid couple of days trying to figure out, like, is it every other one? Is it every other row? Eventually, I gave up and wrote to someone online, Luna, uh, Luna Sorcery on Twitter. Go follow her uh, for good tweets about computers. And she figured it out within an hour. So like, wow, good job. Stan Luna. Here's what Luna figured out. So we read this all, uh, the entire chip, from bottom to top, left to right. And I will just show you the data, each block after each block. You can kind of see across the top there are delineations there, which is one block of data. This whole thing is 256 bytes. So here's the first block. And Luna discovered that you read the top right bit of every other block. Uh, and then for the next byte, you take the ones that you didn't read the last time and then moving left from there. So we'll read it out. Here's a 0 at the top right. Then skip a block, a 0, skip a block. 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, skip 1. And that is a Z80 instruction. Uh, <laughs> that's hexadecimal 31, which is load the stack pointer uh, to a 2-byte value, which is exactly what you want to be doing when you start a computer. You want a stack to work with. Uh, and Nimixi figured this out just by looking at pictures that look like this, or looking through a microscope that <laughs> looks like this. Now, there's a section in the Game Boy Emulator Developers Wiki about this, and the impact section starts, apart from amazement. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I hope someday I do something like so neat that like, in the end, impact section, Wikipedia goes, well, first it was cool. <laughs> And then goes on to say, that feature is now included in several emulators. Um, unfortunately, doing this is probably too hard now. Uh, devices no longer use masked ROM because it's very big. People use NAND ROM, which you could look at it, but it would take a really long time, and ROM is much larger now. But the moral of the story is, you can learn a lot from a computer by looking at it. <laughs> And there are still researchers who take this approach. Uh, there are still security researchers who are able to read data from chips 
um, by looking at them under a microscope. That's a very invasive form of penetration testing. Man, you need to take the computer apart. Um, but people still take this approach. Also, if you're interested, the original Cherry Roms thread about this is extremely funny because uh, it's a mix of people who really knew what they're doing and really don't know what they're doing in the same time, <laughs> in the same person. Like, people correctly identifying, like, man, we could get this if we had a scanning electron microscope. Do you think we could buy one from eBay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's all I got. I'm Lido.